Hey, what's up? Welcome to the recording of my workshop, My Cloud, I Rule My Data and I Rule How I Communicate. This workshop was presented at the FrostCon 2020 online conference and this recording is for their media archive. I am incorporating everything that happened during the workshop in a quick view as part of the feedback from the participants. Let's get started right away. So a little bit about me, I am Oscar Najera. I also go under nickname Titan C on social code, on social platforms for code sharing like GitLab or GitHub. I once did a PhD in theoretical physics where I was running large scale simulations on quantum mechanics and I was responsible for configuring the server, the cluster indeed, where those simulations were going to run. That's how I discovered, learned, and even developed a taste for configuring servers. Since then, I have moved to work with the people at Thrive29, developing our software solution for monitoring IT infrastructure. Uh, having said that, I am here in my personal representation, not the one of my employer, and anything I say during this workshop is out of personal choice. Now that the legal stuff is also out of the way. Um, why I'm giving this workshop? What is that I want to teach about the cloud? And I want to start, of course, with the state of the cloud and Linux. And I love this cartoon. This is so sweet, right? There's this little penguin asking what are clouds made of? And the answer really satirical and better in our free software contest is Linux servers. Yeah, and to me, this really makes me happy. I mean, we have this wonderful software we have developed over the last decades and has been powered servers all over this time and is powering this cloud technology um, revolution where everybody gets access to their um, servers, uh, data online. And I think it's a wonderful technology. It makes for me, for example, having my remote backups a lot easier to have really code um, sharing with other people a lot easier, a lot um, nicer to, to share with people. Communication is also a lot easier and at a really reduced cost. And yet we have this campaign from the Free Software Foundation Europe, which would seem would be against this. Like, yeah, there are bad players in the cloud and it is true what they say here. It's like there, there is no cloud, there's just other people's computers. Yeah? There is nothing like this ephemeral thing where you, you can just store your data. Like it goes into someone else's hands. And that is the awareness they wanted to raise. Uh, unfortunately, I think they didn't provide enough alternatives. Like, what can you do uh, regarding this issue? What, how can you secure your privacy? Or uh, how would, what are good service providers? And of course, they should say, what is their definition of a good provider? And I want to address this at a deeper fundamental level on... Why would be the Free Software Foundation against the cloud? Or what is it that we are actually against? And if I list the four fundamental freedoms of free software, like the freedom to use, to study, to share, and to improve. Yeah? These fundamental freedoms, the freedoms that we fight for in free software, are based on a very fundamental assumption, is that you control the hardware where you're software is running. And power is an old term because with virtualization and all those things, what really matters is that you control the runtime environment of your software. That's what you have, that's where you have the control and the power to exercise all these freedoms. And without that assumption, without that control over your runtime environment, all these freedoms are rendered useless. And someone else is to many extents as enslaving you on the way you use your software 
and as we have developed in the recent um, realized in the recent years is not only the software you use and execute but it's also the data you store so what can we do right and i want to propose you an answer of attitude this is not a solution it's an answer and an answer has trade-offs yeah you have to pursue this and i would like to pursue the same spirit that we have as free software mm, uh, participants as participants of this community of being rebels and actually doing the things the way we like them so we can actually host our own cloud services and we do there all the choices we take all the choices we want uh, we run them the way we want, under the conditions we want, because we are in control. We should be in control. And of course, this is where your hands get dirty. This is where you put your money where your mouth is. And this is where you also have to pay upfront. Because in this cloud revolution, all the service providers are giving us things for zero upfront monetary costs. But if you want to go your way, you have to also accept that all these things need to be funded. And I would like to encourage you here and say, thanks to Moore's law, and that computing has been becoming every year more powerful and also cheaper, you can have access to your own virtual uh, private server for as little as a kebab a month. And I want to compare with this with food because, of course, there is no free lunch. But also on the analogy that even as a student, I would buy this food on an impulsive way. I, I know it is possible to afford this once a month. And what you gain out of it is really full control of your computing infrastructure, full control of your data because you have root access to the servers where your cloud services are running. And I believe that is a fair price. Okay, so what will I need? What will you need to do this? And what are you getting out of this workshop? Because I am promising you that with this workshop, you will have the knowledge and the resources to start um, configuring your personal cloud and running your own cloud services. So of course, as I said, you need this rebel attitude to want to do it your way, but you also need the joy of doing things your way. The joy of tinkering with your server, with your configuration files, so that is everything is neatly set up the way you like it. Yeah, this is something you need to extract joy out of it to, to go until the end. Yes, I am going to provide you solutions that you can actually plug and play and they will work, but it's really nicer when you actually enjoy the process because it's what keeps you up, uh, what will help you um, maintain your, your server. And it's also, I think part of the, the happiness I extract with this joy of thinking is when I get my solution is the solution I like. When I get someone else's solution, I get an average solution. An average is not bad. Average is just average. But there might be some times where you think, oh, this is just too complicated. I would like it simpler because I like things simpler in this particular environment. And in a different environment, again, you will get the average answer for everyone, but you will say, no, this is just too simple. I need an extra personal configuration. I need an extra configuration that is not on the average system and this is where having control of your runtime environment of the software you're running having all the control helps a lot because you can make these choices and you can feel happier at the end that you have gone this path the next thing you have to acquire this is Simpler. Let's say you just have to buy a server that's going to be online. Uh, you can go for your dedicated service uh, server, but um, with the virtualization, um, with the solutions virtualizations uh, provided, you can also get a virtual private server, a VPS, 
and they are a lot cheaper. This is what makes this accessible for you that you are running your own server all time online. Um, I am showing you this uh, website, Low End Box. They are an aggregator of deals. You will find all of the cheap deals. This is where service providers advertise their uh, services and you can filter after region, after virtualization technology or any other special thing you might want. You can go from the very cheap deals to the higher end deals. Um, what I will say is you might even get some reviews on the services on this platform, but it's not always um, a, a good review. It's better to just go out and test. Out of personal uh, belief and experience, I would recommend picking servers that are close to your geographical location because latency is an important factor. It makes things much nicer when when you notice your server is responding um, yeah, in a short period of time. Um, you will also need to get a domain name uh, so that you can access your server not through their IP address but through a human memorable name. Okay, and then the thing I'm going to teach you, the software I'm going to use is Ansible. Ansible is a configuration manager. And this is just a fantastic uh, tool because uh, at the same time that it manages your configuration, it forces you to document your configuration. And this is the nice thing because the way you document is the way you configure. So in having this very simple way of declaring your desired state of the server and at the same time being uh, such a strict declaration that the software can understand it and then play this configuration on your server is really nice. And how does it look like? I have here two examples. Uh, and in Ansible, what you use are YAML files. YAML is a markup language, you know, very structured. And the way you define in Ansible a task is by enumerating it uh, with a name. Then you write your documentation, your goal of this task, in this case, install packages. For a Debian-based system, you install packages with APT and Ansible provides you under the same name an APT module to manage your installed packages. So you just call this APT module. I will say I want packages and I enumerate these packages. And by default, what Ansible does is uh, make sure these packages are installed. There are uh, some extra flags where you can say, make sure it's also the updated version of this software or make sure the, these packages are not installed. So, and then they will be removed. Another characteristic you have is this tags section where you mark this tasks and this is very helpful for example when you are tuning your configuration and you don't want to execute the entire playbook the entire recipes that you have uh, configured for your server you're just targeting very little uh, specific uh, parts of your configuration this speeds up the process because if you're managing your configuration over ansible it is an intermediate step so it feels slower. Ansible has also some um, slowness in the fact that it, it is connecting to the server, it is playing the execution, it's not as fast as just logging into the server and execute a commando. But this discipline that feels a bit slower is what gives you the flexibility in the future to reinstall your server in a different host. Um, if something happens, you know you can always reinstall and bring your server to the desired configured state that you like. And you don't have to worry, oh, what are all the steps, all the things I did uh, in the past. They are all documented through Ansible and they are executable. So you also win time. Uh, another example I want to show you is, for example, again, a new task. And this time I'm setting up the firewall rules for web traffic and SSH. So I use the uncomplicated firewall module I say I want a rule to allow some ports 
Within this curly braces, I am going to replace items. And here are the items I'm going to replace. And I use HTTPS and SSH because those words are understood by the uncomplicated firewall. Otherwise, I would just put the port numbers if you have other specific ports. And then finally, I defined the protocol for which I'm going to open these ports. And this is a flat syntax in this case. You can also nest this to a specified rule, two dots, and then allow, and then port and protocols in the same way as up here. So you have this flexibility and it's more how you decide to organize this. Again, I put a task to make sure maybe I'm just configuring firewall rules and I would like to play the Ansible playbook only for these tasks that follow this tag. And now having this Ansible software helping you configure, the next step would be to configure all your server. And then you would go all over the process of figuring out what you need. And to help out you with this process, I'm going to use the Sovereign project. And Sovereign is a set of Ansible playbooks to build and maintain your own private cloud. So over the years, contributors to this project, we have uh, noticed what we need to configure on our, ser on our servers and done some pull requests and help you with the configuration of it. So this project takes you from start to finish uh, in, the, in your configuration journey for your private um, cloud. What I also like about this project, it has a very minimal approach. It for, it's for that reason also quite opinionated on the way it's uh, laid out. But when it's minimal, it means also lower maintenance. And lower maintenance is less things to worry about. Lower, less things are also a, a smaller attack surface for your server. It's, yeah, less of a mental challenge to keep up of all the things you have to do and have co to configure on your server. Less is really more power. And also because it's minimal, you can go all over the project, you can read it all, and you should. You should become aware of what is it that you're configuring in your server. And this is also nice because it gives you an empowerment of, of taking control of what is on it and making it easy for you to change it. And also you realize how little you need to actually have this service running. So to sum it up, what will you need to set up your private cloud? The joy of thinkering, the joy of configuring your server, the joy of having things the way you like and putting the work to get there. You will need a virtual private server. That's the cheapest solution, uh, a domain name so that you can access your server. You will learn with me a bit of Ansible and the Sovereign project, which has all the recipes. So let's get started. You will notice I'm not uh, linking you to the main project, but to a fork of myself and a fork prepared to this for this workshop. This fork has been tested recently and it is what I currently use also for my private server with less configurations. But because I had these things done, it was easier to, to play this workshop and to, to offer you this branch. So as you can see, um, it is forked from the main project and there are not so many commits separating it from the main project. I have edited the readme, so it should be straightforward for you to follow it. And the main changes I have for this project are that um, I'm not, uh, this playbook will run not on Debian 8.3 like the, like the main project, but on the latest Ubuntu long-term support release, Ubuntu Focal. So when you get your private server, you should get it with this uh, OS installed. Uh, I have, of course, dropped a lot of features from the main project. I want to keep it minimal and I want to only configure your email server, your file sharing platform uh, and file synchronization, uh, your VPN, 
and your Git repositories. Uh, we will have as a good practice monitoring, firewall management, and configuration of the SSH keys. All this comes in the box or out of the box in this project. So to get started, of course, buy your VPS, get it with Ubuntu Focal, and buy a domain name. SSL certificates to keep your communications encrypted are managed over Let's Encrypt, which is a fantastic project. So, setting up the DNS. The DNS, you can set it up with your domain register, sometimes even with your, uh, let, let me log in, with your uh, service provider for the VPS. I personally, oh, my login is not working. Something is wrong. Now I'm in. Okay, I personally manage my DNSs with Cloudflare. Cloudflare provides a pretty good service for managing them and how they propagate their service. They also pro provide a common line uh, tool, so you don't always need to go to the website to change these things, and that's a big plus for me. So where do you start? I bought this domain. And you set the A record for this domain to the IP address of your server. And you do that also for the subdomains, mail, get, and cloud. You all make them point to your IPs, the IP of your server. You configured an MX record as it is exemplified here, pointing to your email, to your mail point. And you set up a TXT record for the SPF. That's again also for email. And that's it. That's all you need to do um, with the DNS. And you just wait a little bit until they propagate. And then you can use them. So when you have your server newly um, installed from your VPS, it has nothing. And you will get from your VPS an email telling you, well, now you can... SSH into the server with root password. Now, because I am going to show you a server I just configured, this will not work. Because for security reasons and practices, we don't allow in our SSH configuration of our server to log in as root or end with password authentication. But the first time you do it, you will have to put the password your VPS service provider has given you. Um, so what I'm going to do now is log in with the user I configured for this, the deploy user. Uh, and let's clear this. So this will be what you get as soon as you log in. And what you want to do there is to make sure you have sudo and Python 3 installed, sudo for giving the user uh, a normal regular user access to administrator rights and you will need Python 3. As a good practice, you need to set up a new root password. Then you set up this deploy user, which is the one we're, we're going to use to configure the server. You give him a password as well. And you configure for password at sudo if you like that convenience. Otherwise, you can only, you can, you only need to ask add the deploy user to the sudo group. And that's actually all the configuration you need to do on the server. The next thing you are going to do is copy your SSH key to your server. And this time they will, it will ask you for the password of this deploy user for the first time. And then any further, any new connection will be handled over these SSH um, keys. And that's pretty much configuration on in place configurations on the server. The next thing are going to be handled by Ansible. So you download my project. You go into it. I will go. I have already this done. Downloads Froscon. No, sorry, not downloads. Documents Froscon Sovereign. 
And you have to check out the FrostCon 2020 branch, of course. That's why this instruction is there. And you download all the submodules. I only have one submodule, and that is to configure Nextcloud. Nextcloud is the file uh, sync and share software. And that's because the main sovereign project still configures on, configures on cloud. And I really like the new fork. And there is a really nice um, project that helps you on that configuration. And because in Ansible you can compose your fl um, playbooks and you even have the Ansible Galaxy where you can find all these other uh, playbooks uh, and find them and compose them. It's a really nice feature. Uh, what else? Yes. Now, your personal configuration is going to be managed in this file. You can find it under group vars. So I'm going to show you the content of it. Group var sovereign. Here you configure, it's again a YAML file. You configure your domain, the one you bought your main username, you set up an organization name. Um, then here you define the administrator email, which is composed using this curly braces from the main username that I just defined here at the domain. <laughs> and then you define your virtual domains. This is because your server can have can run as an, the email server for multiple domains. So you will have to define the name, the domain. In this case, I'm just going to manage the Najera PW email server. And I assign it a number. If you want to manage for other domains, and in this point, you just replicate this. Your users follow the same structure. You first define an account. You give, him a, you give it a name and the domain it belongs here. I'm just going to replace. If you have other domains, you do the same thing. Uh, you give it a password. It's plain text. I know this is not a nice way. And now that I'm sharing you this password, of course, I am vulnerable. This email is vulnerable to all of you. But because I'm just having this server running for this workshop, I'm fine sharing it for now. It's also only the email password. And then you match the domain number to here. If you have many other uh, email domains that you're supporting, you have to do this matching. Finally, you can have virtual addresses. So it's if someone would write to the root user at the admin domain, Najera PW, this will end up in the admin account email. So you have this for root, postmaster, webmaster, and abuse. And that is it. That's the email configuration. And then for the VPN configuration, you say the clients and you enumerate how many VPN clients do you want to have. That is it. To configure Git on uh, first instance, you have to copy your public key to this folder. I have done that as well. It's status. So you will see it's not committed, but I have copied that file. And under the hosts file, I mark uh, under the sovereign group. You will notice I repeat sovereign many places here or here. Um, so under the sovereign group, I give in my server IP or my server uh, domain name because it's, it can be reached over DNS. If your server is running your SSH um, on a different port than the standard one, please configure on this file the port uh, SSH is going to be accessible. Otherwise, once the firewall is on, you will not be able to log in. And you will have to find um, other alternative to get into your system. Mostly, most uh, VPS service providers will offer you a VNC alternative or even through their web interface. And that is it on configurations. Um, the main playbook for Ansible is this site uh, file, site YAML, 
where uh, you have to configure the specifics. You say, do this on all the hosts you have. We only have one host belonging to the Sovereign project. If you would have many other configurations, um, this is how you compose in Ansible. You just say for which host it, or host group it, this should uh, be executed, and it takes the name that it's here. Which user is the one that you're going to use to for login? This is deploy user that we just configured a little while back. You say this is a user that has to become um, root user, so it will use sudo. That's why you have this become true. If you were to log in directly as root user, which I don't recommend, um, you wouldn't need this. And gather facts is you let Ansible get information from the server. This is when we set up um, operating system specific variables or things like that, that you want to have some information of the server. Then you configure the roles. These are the things you're going to configure. We have in a common role, uh, which is the basic setup of the server, then the email server, the VPN, the Git. I commented out a lot of things from the original project. The Nextcloud role is a bit more extensive, but this is the basic configuration you need. Uh, you configure it also to take the Let's Encrypt uh, certificates we're generating. And finally, as a good practice, you, have, you need to have a monitoring solution. And that is it. So the next thing you just do is you run this playbook and it will connect to your server and start going all over going over your configuration. Because this is an already configured server, uh, you will notice I get this okay quite soon because it means nothing has changed from the way I liked my server to be. Now it's updating the uh, repositories, it changes because yeah, I haven't run this in maybe a day and I have to get new repositories. But for example, when I'm updating the, upgrading the packages that are fundamental, uh, I most probably also get a, an okay state. No, it even changed, so it's a good thing to run this playbooks quite often. Uh, although through unattended updates, um, at least the security issues are uh, taken care. And so this playbook will run for a while, maybe half an hour, maybe even an hour, depending on the resources of your server and your speed connection and the latency you have to your server. But once it's done, it's finished. Then all you have to do is configure on your client side. Your email, you should use an email client if you want. I personally like them. Oh, this failed. Uh, why is this failed? Unable to connect the database. Oh, something is quite wrong here. This was unexpected for this recording, so I'm going to pause the recording and figure out what went wrong. Hey, I'm back. So I figured out what went wrong with my server. And the thing is, as uh, you saw before, it updated uh, some packages. And within those packages, I went over the installation log and it was, um, it were packages corresponding to the Postgres database. Apparently there was a failure, well, there was actually a failure during that update and some of the configuration files I don't manage, but are taken directly for the def from the default were um, overwritten. And there was a failure during that overwrite and those one of those files ended having, instead of content, the failed instruction from the gzip command comment that extracts uh, the content into this file. So after figuring that out and finding the a new where that uh, file is, um, I forced a reinstall on, on this package. Then uh, things started to work. I did took uh, some time to figure this out and fix it and make sure then the entire playbook ran. Uh, but now is it, that's the case. Uh, in your case, if this failure doesn't happen, um, when you run the playbook, you will um, have it running for you. Um, set, that, uh, set that aside, yes, this is normal, this happens. Nothing goes uh, all, always correctly, the way you like. 
and that is what is that's why it's also very important to have a good monitoring solution for your um, server. Um, the basic one that it's in the project monint is good. Um, I personally use uh, CheckMK because I work on that software um, every single day and it's actually very good software. And I was also testing not only on the installation of this uh, server, but on my personal server if things were wrong there as well, but they weren't um, because it, they didn't fail there. So as you can see right now on, on the left, uh, the install completed. Uh, 172 things didn't change and 11 needed some kind of update or, or change in some particular way. Uh, but now it is done. The, the server is working, running, and you have to configure it for yourself. Uh, as I started last time, in the email, you do it with an email client. You can use Mozilla Thunderbird, for example, uh, where you simply uh, copy the information that is here when you're uh, setting up your server for that or for the SMTP, so email to receive and SMTP to send email. And it will set it up. Uh, the way the service is um, installed is I also suggest you to test sending an email to this address. You will test you can send an email and you will get uh, back uh, an evaluation how good your email sending uh, procedure is if you're passing some tests. Um, in my server, DKIM is not configured in the original Sovereign project. It is configured and you can use that. I personally just find too much configuration for and not much benefit, so I just leave it out. Um, but it's a nice way to test uh, your server for email. Uh, another nice thing of the monitoring solution that it's installed by default here is you get a summary of things that have happened because this is a newly installed server. I get a summary of the many things that were installed. This was prepared for the um, uh, workshop when it was live. And that is it. That's the email. Get the web service goes under this address git and the web interface is sigit which is a very fast interface and many free software projects still use this if they haven't been swallowed by github and it is a really fast uh, web interface that works pretty well all your private repositories are not shown here of course and they are managed by Gitalite. Gitalite actually manages everything. And to configure it, you need to download it. You download this repository and it's again a text file you edit to keep your configuration. I have posted the link uh, to their guide. The VPN, so after you have um, run the playbook, Ansible will copy all the generated files to this directory. This is how our Ansible copies. Tells you from which host it came and the path. And as I showed you before in the configuration file, this one group var sovereign, I only configure a VPN connection for my laptop. So I only get a folder with the necessary keys and certificates for my laptop. And I also linked to the main project wiki page where it tells you how to configure this on your local client. Use the Jesse server configuration. It's the same and it changes only when selecting the cipher and the HMAC uh, authentication. For the next cloud, um, you again go to this new subdomain cloud and then your domain name. The admin is the one you set up here. And once the, this role has run, it will create for your domain the password. So the 
what is inside this file is what is the password for the admin user. And once you go in, you can configure uh, more users. You can put uh, the extra apps for your calendar or contacts. You can even have an email app and then you can have web mail configure. That's another reason why I don't have the main project email run cube installed because I really don't need it. The monitoring solution you have here is very basic. It goes over an SSH tunnel. Okay, uh, wrong. I cannot copy this. I need to edit my address exactly. And then you can log into it. And it tells you what is running and what is not currently monitored. I personally don't use this alternative. I use in my personal life uh, ChickenMK, as I said it. It is much more, um, advanced in the capabilities of what you can use and how much you can monitor. It always finds something wrong. It keeps you really updated of what needs to be worked on. It discovers automatically many services and sets up quite good defaults. So there's a lot of knowledge into this um, tool prepared to monitoring your, your servers or other um, devices, environments, containers, has a lot of un under the box. And it tells you, of course, uh, if something is well or not well, um, in OK, warns and criticals, and notifies you to your email or to any preferred notification system you have set up. And that is it. That is all I wanted to tell you during this workshop. I encourage you to go out and try this, to go out and take ownership of your cloud services. And yeah, have fun. <laughs>